credit to God. I, uh, I've, I've once heard it said, you know, evangelism and, and, and sharing the gospel it can be a tough thing. And a lot of people, you know, myself included, are like, well, maybe I don't, what if I don't have all the answers? What if somebody asks me a question I don't know? Or, or what, if I, I, I don't, what if I don't have enough practice in this? And uh, I think this week is on display um, that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips those who he calls. And so, I, I didn't feel very equipped coming into this week, um, but, but God gave me exactly what I needed. So, I just want to take a moment to, to send, the, send the praise where it belongs. Um, as you guys open up your handouts there uh, for Thursday morning, today we're going to look at changing the world, and we're going to look at what evangelism is. Evangelism is, at its, at its, ba- its most basic definition, just sharing the gospel with the world. And so, I know it's been a while since you guys have probably seen a video clip, and oh, how refreshing is it, right? Like, I'm not distracted by it. Although, I did see a chipmunk run under, like, run under the benches earlier today, so that was, that was, pretty, that was pretty amusing. But um, if, did we end up getting the video to work? Is that going to be all right? All right, cool. Um, so what, what we're going to have here is a video up on the screen, so put yourself where you can see it. You might have to do one of these or one of these or, or look at one of the screens. But here's the thing. It's early, right? So you guys have to focus really carefully, all right? You have to focus really carefully. This is an awareness test. All right, it's an awareness test. So get, get, get yourself to a point where you can see the screen. Can everybody see the screen? Can everybody see what? Okay. Can you see the screen? This is an awareness test. We're going to see how sharp you guys are this morning. Here we go. This test. How many passes does the team in white make? Watch it. Keep going. Here we go. Count it. Count it. The answer is 13. Did you see the moonwalking bear? Oh, that moonwalking bear. You see him in the middle? You see him right there? Like, there he goes. <laughs> so you still didn't see him, right? That's all right. That's all right. Uh, it's easy to miss something you're not looking for. There he is. See him? See the bear right there? Right over here. See him right here? I mean, it's a guy dressed up as a bear, but he's mo- he's moonwalking. Yeah, it's a real bear. All right, if you don't get it this time, we're just gonna move on. Then, no, there he is, right there. See him? See him? Like he's doing a little, doing a little moonwalk there. <laughs> so, some of you guys are like 13. Yeah, I got it, right? And how many of you saw the moonwalking bear? <laughs> a couple, right? But eventually, you saw the moonwalking bear, right? Now, the thing is. It's easy to miss things that we're not looking for. That'll take us to our first point on our notes. It's easy to miss things we're not looking for. Uh, it's easy to miss things we're not looking for. So in that awareness test, we're so focused on, all right, how many, how many pulses does the white team make? And so we're counting, like, how many passes. And at the end of the video, you're like, yeah, 13, I got it. And then, meanwhile, a, a bear moon walked through the video, and you didn't see him. So I thought that was a pretty, pretty cool way to open this up. My dad shared that one with me. That was pretty cool. Um, but if, when, we're, when we go through life, if we're so busy counting the passes, or we're focused on a particular thing, if we're so hyper-focused on one thing, things moving around, swipe up, swipe over. Not oh, what's in this story. Oh, what's going on here today? If we're looking at all these things, it's easy to miss something that, or miss someone, even even worse, to miss someone that's right in front of us, that is hurting and that needs Jesus. And so, if we hit the next one here, um, uh, one, once upon a time, I was thinking about social media and the impact it has on on our society. And you know, there there are certain great things. Um, in our small group the other day, we were talking about how somebody, like, they commented, hey, I like your nails, and that actually, like, spurned a conversation later, and they actually got to, you know, talk about um, some real things after that. Um, but the question I have for you is, how can we see and love people when we're so consumed with views and likes? Because every time Jesus had a meaningful interaction with an individual, the Bible says so often, and he saw them. Right? We're going to look at Jesus seeing the woman at the well today, and he loved them. Right? You can't love somebody that you don't see a need in. 
And do you see what, see what we did here? How can we see and love people when we're so consumed with views and likes for chasing after that digital affirmation, if you will? How can we see and love people when we're so consumed with views and likes? So we're going to go to the Bible here today, and we're going to look at what evangelism looks like, what it looks like to share the love of Jesus with the world, and what better example to use than the way that Jesus shared himself with the world. And so we're going to go to John 4, John 4, 7. John 4, 7. And uh, I summarize this as an awkward encounter with Jesus because as we unravel this story here, uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to realize that uh, the, this, is a pretty, this is a pretty bold thing that Jesus did here. So as you guys are turning to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John, we've been in quite frequently this week. In John 4, um, Jesus was, was going, traveling from one place to the other, right? And so he had two choices. And this is most Jewish people in his day. There was a, an area called Samaria, right? And so uh, the Jews and the Samaritans had a bad history, okay? Way back in Israel's kingdom, it was Israel and it was the northern Israel, and then they kind of split off. And so the people of Israel hated the Samaritans because this, uh, in history the Samaritans had like, uh, they kind of intermingled with the native peoples, and they looked at them as like, Kind of like mudbloods, I guess, for the Harry Potter fans out there. But they looked at them like half, like half breeds, right? And 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 so there was like it was pretty, it was legitimate racism. Like the Israel, the, the people of Israel were like, no, Samaritan, mm, I won't have anything to do with you. Like, and so a lot of times, what what uh, Jewish people would do is they would actually like, here's the map, right? I'm trying to get from here to here, and Samar Samaria's in between. They would go like this. <laughs> like, I can go through there. I don't want to interact with any of those people. That's how that's how much of a of a divide there was between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. So we have to understand that context. And so Jesus is by himself at this point. His disciples are traveling with him, but he kind of went off ahead and, and was doing his own thing. And let's look at this interaction that he has with this woman. All right, so John 4, 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Oh, sorry, right before that. What time of day is it? It was the sixth hour. We'll get into that in a second. So verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. There it is. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, have you nothing to draw water with? And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and I won't have to come here again to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And we're going to go into the rest of the story as we unpack this today. Now, the thing I love about the Bible is, is the more you read it, the more you start to see the connections from one place to the other. And remember we talked about how all of Scripture is a coherent story, and it's all pointing to the work of Jesus on the cross. And so it's so beautiful to see how all that unpacks here. But as we look at the way Jesus interacted with this Samaritan woman, I want to tease out a couple of the details in here because it's going to encourage us in how we can share our faith with people. So our point number one here is that faithful evangelism meaning sharing the gospel with other people faithfully, is, is something that requires boldness. It's something that requires boldness. All right, there are three major things that are keeping Jesus, or that would have, would have kept Jesus from interacting with this person. One, she's a woman. 
as I was uh, studying this morning, uh, back in this time, it was said, uh, I guess, best case, if you're talking to a woman, uh, it's a waste of time, and worst case, she's going to lead you into the pit of hell. <laughs> that was, that was kind of how the rabbis rolled back then. Um, yeah, wow, I was right. So for Jesus, a man, to talk to this woman was breaking some serious societal norms. All right? He was really putting himself out there, but so was she in, in talking with him. The second thing is she's, uh, she's a Samaritan. And we talked about the, the history, the bad history, the bad blood between um, Samaria and, and the Jews. All right? um, they, they just did not interact. So this would be like going up to someone that is from a completely different friends group or somebody who's like that weird outcast of a kid or, or they're completely different from you. And if, <laughs> if people saw you together in the hallway, they'd be like, whoa, those two people are talking? It's, it's like that. It's like that. And the third thing is she's an outcast. She's an outcast. Now this would be easy to miss, right? But again, we have to rewind and put ourselves in the right cultural context. And, and this is like the, the first century here. Um, women that were, that were married together, they completely depend on their husband. And if their, their husband died, then the, their, their, their children would take care of them. But the reason that Jesus talks about we need to reach out to widows so frequently is because widows in that time, they had no way of making means for themselves. The, the women had no way of making a living for themselves, and they were, so they were completely dependent on their, their neighbors and their friends. But if you look at verse 6, it says Jesus went there, and it was the sixth hour. So we tell time a little differently than the Bible, but it's about noon, right? So it's the middle of the daytime. Okay, so think about this. If you live in the desert and you need to get some water, what would probably be the best time to go to get the water? Probably in the morning, right? Yeah, most people, most women went to get the water in the morning, and they went in a group. So all the friends, all the women got together. They go as a group in the morning. They get the water for the day. They come back. They bring it to their house. But we notice here that this woman is all by herself, and it's high noon. The only reason she would be there by herself at high noon is because no one else wanted to go with her, and she, maybe she didn't even want to be seen by anybody else. So she was completely alone. She was a complete outcast. She was, she was completely rejected from her, from her neighborhood. See, they had pretty small towns back then. Everybody knew everybody, and they knew what was going on. But Jesus didn't let racism stop him. He didn't let gender differences stop him. And he didn't let cultural norms, or he didn't let this person being an outcast stop him. No, Jesus reached out. So who is it that as we walk through our lives, Jesus puts right in front of us, and we think, well, no, it shouldn't be, because maybe somebody will see me talk to this person, and they might judge me, and they might put me in the same category as them. Jesus was bold in the way that he interacted with her. See, because I know for myself and I know for many people, the biggest thing that keeps us from sharing the word of Jesus is a lack of boldness. So right underneath of outcast, I'd like you to write Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19. Right under outcast, write Matthew 28, 19. Because our biggest obstacle to boldness is fear. But whom shall we fear or what shall we fear? Because in Matthew 28, 19, when Jesus was giving his last words, he said, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with us. What excuse do we have not to be bold? You see, we have nothing to fear because Jesus is with us, and so that's why we can go and share the word of Jesus with our friends or with people we don't even know, and we can share it with them boldly. Faithful evangelism requires boldness. The second thing we see in Jesus' interaction here is that evangelism is relational. The second one, evangelism is relational. And so under relational, you'll see the, the acronym FISH spelled out there. And so, uh, again, all these ideas I'm just taking from people that are smarter than me. This is all God right here. Uh, the first one is, is friendship. So if, you, if you're going to share the gospel with somebody, you have to, you have to initiate with them. You have, to, you have to show them that you, you care about them. There's a, <laughs> in teaching, we say, no one, will know, uh, no one will care about what you know until they know that you care. And no one will know, no one will care what you know until they know that you care. 
So as a teacher, what that means is I have to I have to be able to relate to my students on an individual level. And you guys probably understand that too, right? Like you have those teachers that you just think are really awesome people. You probably enjoy their classes a lot more, right? Because you know that they like actually care about you versus the one that's like, okay, today's chapter eight, section one. Like it, it, you, when when you know that your teacher cares, you care to learn what they know. And so faithful evangelism is friendship. Then, once you have that friendship, the next step is to initiate to the spiritual. So we're going to talk about some strategies for that. S, share the gospel, and H, help them make a decision. And Jesus does all of these things in his interaction with the Samaritan woman. Initiate to the spiritual. So as you're going through your life, what, who are you seeking out intentionally to, to become a friend with? so that you can share the good news of Christ. Now, now I caution you in this because we don't want people to just think that they're our, our project, right? That no one wants to feel like, hey, oh, that Christian person is just talking to me because they're trying to convert me or something, right? Uh, my wife is so good at this. Like, uh, <laughs> when, we, when we first got married, I would come home, and her car was there, and her phone was there, and her, and her purse was at the house, and I'm like, oh, snap, she's gone. Like, she disappeared. But then I would, like, look across the street, and she'd just be, like, talking to our neighbors. We have a lot of elderly neighbors, and, and my wife has a, a heart for the elderly. And it's so cool because she's always just, like, looking for opportunities to engage people. Like, the guy, Dave, across the street, he's, he lives by himself, and, and he lost his his mother, you know, about 10 years ago. He's an older guy, and he's just the friendliest guy ever, but she's always over there, you know, chatting it up, or, or we're next door talking to Tim and Dawn, or, or Gerald, our neighbor behind us, or, you know, yelling over the fence, hey, how's it going? And I just, I'm so inspired by the way my wife engages with our community, and, and it really, it really spurs me on to do that. She's always looking for opportunities, and, and we can always be looking for opportunities to, to form friendships. But when we, when we go to initiate with the spiritual, that's the hard step. That's the hardest step there. And if you hit the next slide, it might be up there, it might not be. I'm having a hard time remembering. There it is. People will never believe that you love them if they don't believe that you like them. So Jesus takes this opportunity. I mean, even in just talking to this woman, she sees, hey, this guy must actually care about me because he's risking a lot to be having this conversation with me. And if people know that you are willing to risk, you're willing to put yourself out there in order to engage with them and to care for them, then they're much more likely to, to care about and to listen to what you have to say. So you can, when, when was the last time you just you complimented somebody uh, that, that, you, that you know that you see hurting or encouraged someone or, or just engaged with somebody in a, in a good conversation on their level? You know, uh, anymore these days, that alone will set you apart, won't it? Like, you ever walk down the hall and you're, e even if you'd like to have a conversation, like, everybody's so consumed with whatever they're doing that, you know, there's not much eye contact, there's not much interaction. So just, like, going up to somebody and be like, hey, Samara, how are you doing today? You know, I, I, love your, I love your shirt. Whatever it is, just compliment somebody. Just encourage someone. Be like, yo, Nick, I saw you. That was a great shot you just made. And that was awesome. Like, like be, that, be that light in people and start to engage and start to, start to, um, Encourage, start to be the light and the salt into the world. The third thing that we need to understand about faithful evangelism is that it's when we put on display how Jesus is all satisfying. During worship this morning, uh, we said, how can you share something with someone that you don't know yourself? How can you share something with someone that you don't have yourself? So that's our challenge, right? Is, is do we, are we all satisfied by Jesus? And if not, what do we have to do to get there? What do we have to repent of? What do we have to bring before the cross? What is there that is lacking? And don't be discouraged because you don't have to be 100% there. No, there's no, there's no rule against sharing your faith. Uh, and only perfect people are allowed to share their faith. That, that's not a rule. You're allowed to share your faith. But your, your testimony will be that much more compelling and that much more true if you, your life displays how all satisfying Jesus is. If we look back in verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus says, I bring living water. I bring life. This stuff is good. This, is, this water contains life. And so if you're sharing the gospel with somebody and they see in your, life, in your life that you're joyful and that you're loving and that you care for people and that you reach out for those people that are hurting or, or the people that are left behind or the people that are left out, that's going to really say something. That's going to really say something. <laughs> now at this point, uh, it comes to mind the phrase, share the gospel. If necessary, use words. 
Okay, okay, I get it, right? Because your actions say a lot. But how are you going to communicate to somebody that they're dead in their sin and the only way to get to, Jesus, to, to God is through the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ and by repenting and confessing your sins and by putting all your faith in Jesus Christ? That, I just had to use words to do that. How are you going to share the gospel with somebody if you're not using words? And so let's look at the next part. And this is the hard part because Jesus confronts sin. Let's look at the next phrase. Jesus confronts sin. He doesn't just have a friendship with this woman. He's not just trying to strike up a conversation. And it's easy to miss this, and this is why I love listening to people who are smarter than me break down the scripture, because there's so much good stuff in there. So, underneath confront sin, I want you to write 16 to 18. 16 to 18. Because Jesus isn't like, he, he doesn't just go there to encourage her and say, oh, okay, well, I'll be your friend. I know you're an outcast in your society. Have a nice day. See you. No. He, he goes deeper. He confronts sin. So let's look at verse 16. Jesus didn't just model goodness. He, he spoke into her life and he spoke truth into her life. That's what we're called to do. So here it is, verse 16. Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come here. Okay, now, uh, does Jesus know everything or just some things? Jesus knows everything. So did Jesus know that this woman had already had five husbands? Yes. At first glance, it's kind of a jerk move, isn't it, right? Like, do, do, like he's talking to the woman, he's like, oh, we'll, we'll go get your husband. Oh, you don't have one? Oh, I, I need, but, but, but look at what Jesus is doing here. He's engaging her, and he's, he's boldly saying, hey, I see that the lifestyle that you've been trying to live, and that you know that it's not working for you, and I know that it's not working for you. Because Jesus is confronting sin, but he's not doing it in a jerk move. He's doing it while extending grace. Because look at what he says. He says, the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. You see, what Jesus did is he confronts sin while extending grace. He didn't say this as a word of condemnation, but he, he spoke into her life and he spoke into her sin. He said, hey, you tried it once, you tried it twice, you tried it three times, you tried it four times, you tried it a fifth, and now you're on your sixth relationship. Are these relationships satisfying you? How's that well working out? Are you still thirsty or are you satisfied? You're in the middle of the desert. You're thirsty for something. You're trying to fill that thirst with these relationships. And you're drinking sand. You're just getting thirstier and thirstier and thirstier. Oh, I come to bring you the living water. I come to bring you life. You see, we're all thirsting for something. And these are the hard conversations to have. But this is where people need to know that you like them so that they will believe that you love them. And, and the way that they know that is you, is you, you, you confront sin while extending grace. Confront sin while extending grace. Jesus didn't, didn't dance around it. He went right to the heart of the issue. And so the fifth thing that Jesus does in that grace is he points her directly to the cross, okay? So imagine this, you're, you're an outcast woman, you're just trying to like keep your head down, get your water at noon, and this guy comes over and tells you everything you ever did about your life. Okay, she's confronted with her own sin. So she's, look at what she does next. Look at what she does next. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So, when confronted with, with her own sin, she, she, she tries to change the subject, right? She tries to ask a theological question. That's what, that's what happened here. You ever had a conversation with somebody that started really going somewhere and you were really getting there, and then they, they, like, they throw like a random theological question or philosophical question, right? People try to, try to dodge it. Okay? Look at where Jesus points. He respects the question. He says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And again, he's, he's, he's given theology. This makes sense as you study the context. But he, then he says, But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And then at the end, the woman says to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. 
Jesus points her to the cross. She wanted to ask a theological question. She wanted to get into the details. Should I worship on this mountain or should I worship on this mountain? And Jesus said, I'm here. He pointed her right to the cross. He pointed her right to the cross. And that's what, that's what faithful evangelism does. Is it points people directly to the cross and it shares the good news. It shares the good news with them that, that it doesn't matter... Uh, that, that, that it doesn't matter where you're coming from. It doesn't matter the mistakes you've made. It, it confronts sin. It asks the question, is that filling your thirst? And finally, it, it points to the cross. So I'd like to uh, invite our worship team up here. Because, oh, we need, we need to change the world. The world needs changing. Our hearts need changing. But the world needs changing. And, and I, I'm done with... I'm done with just hoping that if I'm a good enough person, like if I if I just I, I treat people well enough that maybe one day they'll figure out that I'm a Christian. No, we need to be bold. We need to proclaim the truth that we find in Scripture. We need to proclaim the gospel. Yes, we need to do it in a way that extends grace, and we need to use that fish. We need to we need to get friendships going, and we need to then go from friendship to initiate into the spiritual things. And this is a hard thing to do. Man, you ever try to talk to somebody about this and they just like make a joke or they just kind of like brush it off? I mean, that even happens in church small group. Like, how much more so does that happen in the real world? This is not an easy thing. We need the power of the Spirit to do this. But share the gospel and help them make a decision. So our closing thought here, our closing thought is, in order to reach people for Jesus... I only had one blank, but it's much more complicated than that. How can we see and love people when we're so consumed with views and likes? It's easy to miss things we're not looking for. So the first thing we need to do is we need to look. But write a slash next to that. And, and write the word invest. We need to look. We need to invest. Jesus invested time. And not only did he invest time with this woman, but he risked something. So the last one, bless you, write a slash and write the word risk. In order to reach people for Jesus, I need to look. You need to have your eyes open. God puts these opportunities in front of you all the time. How many of them do we miss? We need to look. We need to invest. We need to be seeking out people intentionally and forming relationships and showing love and listening and being involved in people's lives. And we need to risk. We need to risk. Oh, are we going to let a little bit of fear keep us from accomplishing the mission of God on the earth? Remember, the biggest obstacle to boldness is fear, but Jesus said, I will be with you till the end of the age. You have the power of Jesus inside of you as you go, so you can go boldly. Lord, I thank you so much for the hearts of these young people. And in the small group conversations we've had, I, I know that they want to make a difference. They want to change the world. Lord, when it comes down to it, all of us have that desire, and it's because your heart is in us, and we understand that the world is not as it should be. When we see chaos and when we see evil, we, we, we ask the question, why is this here? Because we know it shouldn't be. God, you've placed that in our heart, that sense of justice. But God, before a holy judge, you've sent one to take our place for punishment of sin, and that is Jesus. And, oh Lord, if we believe that message, if we believe that you are the only way, why are we moving so slow or not moving at all in this direction? You know, even people who don't even believe in God, a complete atheist, I once heard one say, Hey, I don't agree with everything you have to share, but I at least respect that you're sharing with me. Because if we truly believe that the only way to God is through Jesus, then how unloving of us to not share that. God, let us love the people around us. Let us look at them. Let us see them. Let us not just pass by and, and always live in the this, this superficial and always live in the, hi, how you doing? Oh, I'm great. Okay, have a good day. Have a good one. Lord, let us engage with people. And Lord, we need you because people are closed and there's walls built up and, and we need you to break those walls down. So as we prepare to share the gospel, Lord, let us, let us go before you in prayer so that you are with us and you are beside us and you are ahead of us. And let's, let us pray over those people that you place on our hearts that need you. God, we need you and the world needs you. 
And together, this morning, we join you and we say, yes, Lord, we want to be bold. We want to share your good news with the world. God, we love you. And, and as we come to worship you here together for one of our, one of our last times this week, we pray for boldness. It's been so encouraging to see people step up in a small group. Let us step up in the real world as well. Let us take a stand for Jesus.